Yeah. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. So this is Suburban Home at Home, uh, where we get to interview all kinds of different walks of life from emo, alternative, hardcore, punk, whatever. And today I have no offense, the one and only. Uh, so I'm going <laughs> to ask some questions about, you know, YouTube journey uh, to, you know, your pop punk uh, music career mm-hmm. and all that. And yeah. Uh, so can we start by talking about the background behind this project? Um, I'm aware that you started via YouTube. So if you can yeah. kind of include your journey there. Uh, yeah. And I guess like when did you start writing music as no offense? Yeah. So like <laughs> for context, I started out on the internet as a My Chemical Romance fan account. So I- I've always been that emo guy. Um and the only reason I started posting YouTube videos was because I would post MCR guitar covers and singing covers on Instagram before you could post anything longer than 15 seconds. Um, so that's the only reason that I started posting on YouTube. And then a few of those videos blew up and then started like building an audience, doing covers every week. I'd do like Bring the Horizon covers on ukulele. Um, and then, yeah, I started growing an audience, uh, came out as trans. And then, yeah, I think stuff's kind of just been crazy since then. Um, but the, the, the context behind the album was like, yeah, I, I, I essentially grew up on the internet, but because of the whole trans thing, um, I I went to a very conservative boarding school. Um, so I, I pretty much lived a double life, like a Hannah Montana kind of thing, where I was a girl in school and a boy online. Um, and obviously that came with a lot of, you know, strange situations. Um, and I think having an audience when you're a child anyway, you, you're going to see stuff that you don't want to see and people are going to interact with you in ways that you, you don't want to happen. Um, and when I was writing this album, I, I, I didn't go in thinking, oh, I'm going to write this album about that. It was more just like we sat down one day. I had this like voice note idea um, of like growing up on the Internet. Um, and as soon as we started writing that song, I was like, this is what the album has to be about. Because um, the last two EPs were like, oh, Noah discovers therapy. Um, whereas I, I think the thing that was left over to process was the fact that like I grew up with like hundreds of thousands of eyes on me when I was like 15, 16, 17. Um, and I got a lot of my validation from strangers online telling me who I should be, who I shouldn't be, who they want me to be, what they hate about me. Um, and I think there was just a lot of that going on in my life for like past year and a half. I was just like realizing so much about how damaging that was, um, and I think, yeah, a lot of my generation will, uh, I feel like we're a guinea pig generation where we've been given unrestricted access to the internet and just been told to go with it. Um, and we'll we'll definitely realize the repercussions of that maybe in like 30 years. Um, but I, I just felt like it was something important to write an album about. It was kind of just what I needed to process at the moment. Yeah, uh, like you, you make a good point about, you know, the whole guinea pig generation and all that. Um, it makes mm. me wonder with the TikTok, like, artists rising on tiktok now um it's basically like a similar situation to how you were about 10 years ago or whatever where where you were rising on youtube but obviously Mm. back then we didn't have tiktok so it's basically like the same situation so Mm. it's almost like coming full circle i guess (laughs) yeah what i find interesting about that is like i feel like with, with, with a YouTuber with a YouTuber's audience, it's more of like a I think it's more of a dedicated audience because there's people that will tune in every week rather than like just swiping up and down, maybe following someone. But yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see like in the next ten years how the music industry will be, and especially in terms of like people that blew up on TikTok because I know that there are people that blew up on TikTok that will have careers for the rest of their life. Um, but I've already seen TikTokers that have had viral songs got signed by major labels, gone on big tours, and then their next single didn't go viral and they were immediately dropped. Um, So I think it's a really interesting time in music. Yeah, it's also going to be interesting with all the politics about uh, TikTok being banned and all that stuff too. (laughs) Like, I I don't know what's going on with that because I I swear like every six months TikTok is getting banned or whatever. (laughs) But, yeah, well, it's just like an American thing. It's so funny seeing it from the other side of the world and being like, what are you on about? Yeah, well, okay, so I'm in Canada. I'm in Winnipeg. Um, yeah. And, like, the thing with American politics is that a lot of the time when something, you know, gets banned or whatever in America, especially with the mm-hmm. current, like, uh, the current cabinet or whatever, 
it gets banned mm. in Canada too. So. Oh, great! I do not envy you guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So, um, what are your or who are your main influences uh, for just anything really? I guess like so like. <laughs> My my first, I think my favorite band when I was like four or five years old was Green Day. But I like I was so young I don't remember it. But my mom said I would like cry in the car if she didn't put on Green Day. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's that's always been like within me when I write music. Like that that's always how I structure my songs. It's like I guess from that kind of perspective. But um, I think Fall Out Boy was my first love as like a thirteen year old. They were the first band where I'd like go and read up their lyrics. I'd have to Google half the words. Uh, because I was like I was like a child and didn't know what they were talking about um, but that was my first obsession and then I think My Chemical Romance was the big one where I was like okay like this is like my like this this has to be my life somehow like the, the, like this is the coolest thing I've ever seen um, so like My Chem, Emo stuff and then obviously like Pierce the Veil, Dream Horizon um, but I, I grew up on like Nirvana, Foo Fighters, Queens of the Stone Age, Dem Cookie Vultures, my mum was really into David Bowie um, and my dad's had like the world's largest like vinyl collection. So like I- I've always been exposed to like loads of different kind of music. But uh, I think like the punk world, the pop punk world, that that's always been fun for me. Um, so, yeah, I-, I guess to say anything emo and anything that uh, is hyperactive because I- I've got ADHD. So I-, yeah. I need I need constant stimulation and I get bored quite easy. Yeah. So just the scene. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about the production and recording process of the the new album or any of your EPs and albums? Yeah, so like I, so my first writing session was in like 2019. I had kind of just like wrote stuff on GarageBand myself. Um, and as I just had the ADHD. It is impossible to sit me down and to do something for like a few hours at a time. Um, so I started doing writing sessions in 2019, and the first session that I had was with this guy called Stefan Abingdon. Who is like one of my best friends right now, and he he produced the majority of the album. Um, he wrote with me for 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 a good a good good amount of the album as well. Um, so like in terms of the way that we write together, it's like we just go into the studio, hang out. It's kind of like a therapy session, and then we just try and put weird stuff on it. Like we there's there's like there's there's one song where like we've sampled like a screwdriver video that Steph found from Instagram. Um, just stuff like that where like we both just want to. We just but we kind of want to like challenge ourselves, but also just like make something new and exciting. Um, and then I also, uh, there are a few different producers. I had Laurent, um, who was really cool. He did Three Day Headache. That was really fun. Um, and then I don't know if you know McFly over here, um, but they're like, they're like a real big band in the UK. Um, yeah. Like huge. I, I grew up on them. Um, and I wrote a song called Lovely Ladies with them um which was insanely fun um danny produced it as well um and yeah julia sykes i did kind of love it with um that was also really fun but yeah i I think the majority of the stuff that i've done throughout like my career like as no offense has been with my friend steph nice uh so can we talk about a little bit about the lyrical themes uh on the new album uh just yeah uh some of the stuff that uh repeat uh how, how do i phrase this so some of the stuff that comes up a, a lot on the album yeah uh yeah um, so the, the way i described the theme of the album is like i guess it's one third angry trans songs mm. one third mm. songs about um having undiagnosed autism um when i was writing the album i knew i was autistic but didn't have the diagnosis and was going through a lot with that i've since had the diagnosis so it's funny listening back and being like oh my god if only you had that diagnosis um and then three i guess just like i hate the internet um i think it's a recurring theme throughout all the songs even if they're not um if they're not specifically about it there's little links between them about the internet because like i can't really separate who I am online to who I am in person because I, I grew up in that space. And like, mm-hmm. I, I, I was drawn to the internet because I couldn't be myself in real life. Um, so I, I think that's like a, a through line throughout all of them. Um, but yeah, autism, angry trans stuff, because the state of the world right now in terms of like anti-trans rubbish is, uh, is, is quite uh, angering. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, just a, it's just a load of whatever I've been going through the past two years. Yeah, for sure. 
Uh, what is your favorite track or top three favorite tracks from the new album? Okay, good. Top three. I could do that. Oh, oh yeah. I don't know. Sorry. Um, I I can do top three. I, I can't do top one. I think it's... Lovely Ladies is definitely a favorite. Um, it's, it's, it's written from the perspective of the big, scary transgender monster that the conservative media think I am. And I just mm. think it's hilarious that like, that's like the punk song on the album. Um, so that one, there's also a song called Alexithymia, which is the one that I mentioned using a, uh, a screwdriver noise. Um, I think that's weird as hell. There's like a midsection where there's like a role play. You're in a restaurant scene, um, which is ridiculous. But again, it was with Steph and we we're like, let's just do something silly and fun. Um, and then I think maybe subtitles. That was that was a song entirely about autism. Um, and I think it's the best song that I've written lyrically um like ever but like my favorite thing about that is i wrote the entire second verse which is my favorite verse that i've ever written like on the toilet like while i was taking a dump it took like five minutes um and it's like the most emo song on the record uh so definitely those three nice uh so what has the reception been uh for this album from fans of Mm -hmm. of you for like a long time or from people who've just discovered you from, you know, being signed to Hopeless just recently um, or just anything, really. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I mean, dude, it's been great. Like, I feel like I've, I've never sat on a project for this long. Like, we've done EPs, but they, they don't take as long to write. They don't take as long to, like, put out. Um, whereas this one, like, we finished it in October and it's only just come out. Um, so I feel like I've been listening to it so much that I'm like, okay, like I don't care what other people think about it. Cause I, I think it's great. Um, but then when it came out, like I was, I was so pleasantly surprised. Like there's a lot of different stuff on there. There's stuff that I haven't done before. Um, and there was a bit of a worry that people wouldn't be receptive to it, but like, no, it's, it's, it's been great. Like people that have been listening the whole time have told me it's their favorite thing that I've released. And then I've even had people, I've had several interviews and like several people come up to me and be like, look, like I didn't think your album would be very good. Like I, that, like I've been told in like three interviews that they were pleasantly surprised by it, um, which I love. I'm like, that's, I'll take that as a compliment. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with the reception. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that's all that matters. As long as you're happy with the album and as long as you're happy with the reception to it, then yeah, totally. Hey. Um, so uh, I feel like I'm kind of jumping around questions. That's kind of my like, ADHD kind of thing. But um, oh, you're good. <laughs> we're, uh, we're we're kind of nearing the end, kind of in the miscellaneous questions, kind of. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah. So this is more of a general question. A few years ago, like I said at the start of the uh, interview, you released a song with Hot Mulligan, the number one hot new band, and uh, this was the song. Like I said, that introduced me to you. Uh, how did you link up with Hot Morgan? How how did that come to be? Oh, dude, I literally so I had already been. They were like my top band on like Spotify Rap that year. Mm. Like before I had like um, got in contact with them, and it's, it's it's not a very fun story. It's not very interesting. It's literally just like we were like we should have a feature on this song, and my label were just like, oh, what about these bands? And Hot Morgan was one of them, and I was like, dude, like absolutely, like whatever, whatever can make this happen, absolutely. And like yeah. did the vocals for that while he was on tour. I think in the tour bus, um, like it, it, it was, it was a super quick turnaround. But I, uh, yeah, I love what he did with it. Um, I've always wanted to be able to do like yelly vocals, and I, I don't think I have it in me as much as he does. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love his pop. That's awesome. I mean, I just really wanted to hear at least like the story, even if it was boring or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. So that's cool. Um, where are some of your favorite shows you've played to date? In your um, good question. So I, I feel like because like London is like hometown shows. Always like my friends and family always come. Which is always super nice. I do like stage invasions every year, which some people find cringe, but I like there's nothing more fun than having like my mum and dad in their fifties like jumping up behind me on stage. Um <laughs> so I think London will always be the best. Um I just I just come off tour with Ed Shikari like a month ago and I played Wembley Arena, which is like I saw 12, on your Instagram, people. yeah, congrats, yeah. 
which is that, that that was insane and like i like we had a 30 minute set which is not long enough to process the fact that you're on stage at webley um <laughs> but that's one that i'll always be like yeah that that was that was insane and i think in the u.s it's always been like i think chicago has always been my favorite place to play um i don't know if it's just because they have like a great music scene i don't know if it's because like a bunch of my favorite like knuckle parts from chicago like mm -hmm. fuller boys from chicago so there's like that kind of vibe um oh, but then also like i played toronto last year and i had mad tonsillitis like we almost had to cancel the show uh -huh. um but it was like packed out it was sold out and like th there was something special about that show like i think i think a lot of the time people were like i've done three tours in america and i've only ever played one show in toronto um and that's the only canadian show um yeah. so i think the people that are there like really really want to be there um so like chicago toronto and then yeah i think london chicago toronto nice yeah i i feel like with toronto i feel like lots of people will travel to shows like if they're like yeah. in other parts of canada even like mm. um see here, here's the thing like and i know this from experience living in winnipeg um it mm. That uh, when a tour gets announced and it's like a big tour, it's always just mm. Vancouver and Toronto, maybe Montreal yeah. or Quebec City or whatever. Uh, if it's like a yeah. metal tour or whatever, and um, yeah, people will like travel to see the Toronto stuff. Oh god, yeah, yeah. Like, like I know I have people flying in Boston. Yeah, I know tons of people who travel to see a Turnstile at History in Toronto. Oh. Um, yeah, that would have been <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I think that's like all I have. It was a really good interview, really, really fun time talking to you. Cool, no, I had fun too. Thank you so much for yeah. having me. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, uh, you're in Toronto tonight, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, which venue are you playing again? Uh, oh, God, Velvet Underground. Velvet, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, have a good time with that one, and uh, the, the support looks cool, and yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Cheers. Yeah, Thank no problem. Me. Yeah, have a good one. Bye-bye.